In the book of Jude, verse 3 and 4, as we were in this text to begin our message this morning, I'm going to read these two verses tonight. I want to preach a message this evening titled Mormonism. It's been several years since we've looked at this subject, and we're talking about the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, or referred to by many as the LDS. He says here, as we come to this passage, I'm going to be reading these two verses to begin our message tonight. And uh, we want to expose this cult this evening, but at the same time, we also want to treat people with dignity and respect. And if we can find that balance. They need to be saved. They need to know the truth. I've met several that have come out of Mormonism. I know some personally. And uh, we need to expose this cult and still yet at the same time, respect uh, people and uh, give them dignity and respect. And also at the same time, we realize that we cannot fellowship with Mormons. How many agree with that tonight? There is no way that we can fellowship with them. October the 2nd of this year, just a month or so ago, we preached a message titled, The Marks of a Cult. I gave you three thoughts. One was extra-biblical authority. Number two was a distorted view of the Godhead. And number three was a divided loyalty. And Mormonism, uh, all three of these are true in this cult. He says in verse 3, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, again, we thank You tonight for the privilege that You've given us to assemble together. We pray, Lord, Your blessings upon the reading of Thy precious Word, which in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's name, Amen. And you may be seated. First of all, let me make mention also of another organization that is closely associated with the LDS, and that is the RLDS, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. I believe that now they also call themselves the Community of Christ. This organization is the second largest branch of the Mormon movement. Now, they don't like to be called Mormons, but they still use the Book of Mormons, so you can refer to them as Mormons because they embrace this doctrine. Now, there are differences between them and Mormons. There are some differences in doctrinal beliefs, but again, they still embrace the Book of Mormons and its doctrines. Now, I'm not going to preach on them tonight, But I did want to say this. It is the second largest branch of the Mormon movement. That is the RLDS. And when Joseph Smith died, Brigham Young was chosen as the church's new leader, and a minority of Mormons rejected him and chose to remain in Iowa and Illinois and were led by Joseph's first wife, Emma Smith, and their son, Joseph Smith III. This group established the RLDS and set up its headquarters in in Independence, rather, Missouri. The majority of Smith's Mormons, after he died, followed Brigham Young. They followed him to Utah in 1846 and 47, where he became the territorial governor in 1851. And Young instituted polygamy in Utah in 1852 by claiming divine revelation. Now, what I'm going to do this evening, I have about five thoughts I'm going to give you. I could spend three or four weeks preaching on this subject, and I've chose to condense uh, this in just one evening, one night. But I want to give you just a brief introduction this evening, then I want to speak to you about some history, and I'm going to read a few quotes also. And then I want to speak to you about the doctrine of Scripture, and the doctrine of God, and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons this morning I preached a message titled Historic Christianity. 
and uh, and they violate all of the things that I preached on this morning that we find in Holy Scripture. Now, you'll notice as we read here again, and before we uh, turn away, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 16 after we read this again. But you'll notice that in verse 3 and verse 4, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which is once delivered unto the saints. He gives us the reason for contending for this faith that was once delivered, that is, in the first century, by Jesus Christ and through His apostles. In verse 4, He said, For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Mormonism violates these verses that we just read as we also read this morning. I want, by way of introduction, again, turn to Romans chapter 16 and let me read there. The founder of the Mormon church is Joseph Smith. The date was April the 6th, 1830. Mormonism claims to be the true church. All others are wrong according to their doctrine and according to Joseph Smith. They have been around for about 180 years. Membership, uh, I didn't go back and recheck this. I'm, I'm pulling from some older notes, but I believe the membership is at least 10 million now. And it's increasing every year at a rate of at least 200,000 converts. They have probably well over 50,000. I mean, years ago it was 20 and 30 probably have well over 50,000 missionaries. They encourage every boy and girl from ages 19 to 21 to serve two years as a missionary on a self-supporting basis. 1982, the church had accumulated assets estimated of over $2 billion. Now that's, I believe, over $25 billion, uh, $3 million a day from ties of membership of people that are in the church. Joseph Smith according to the Bible, would not qualify to even be a deacon in a local church, much less to be a prophet or a leader, because the Bible says that the pastor is to be the husband of one wife. And he had who knows how many, some say 28 to 55, who knows how many that he had. I've never even spent any time trying to figure all of that out. The organizational structure is one prophet leads the church. Under him in authority is the council of the twelve apostles. A third group of men are called the first and second council of the seventy. All of these men are called the general council. Now, you and I know that the Mormon church has infiltrated mainstream Christianity in many ways. And I hope you don't watch television, but years ago when I watched television, they had many ads. You know, they had, I'm sure they're still doing that today. They have TV ads. They use much of the same terminology that you and I would use as Christian. And they are, they infiltrate ministerial associations, try to get into the communities as Christians. They like to be called saints. But until recently, they, um, they've they taken on the name Christian. They don't mind being called Christian now, but normally they like to be called saints. And uh, as we consider the Mormon church, I say again, they are a cult. They are not Christians. They may be some nice people. They may make nice neighbors. They may portray themselves as family-oriented and all those kind of things, but they are not Christian. Now, that's very clear. I gave you a handout this morning, and I hope that you looked over that and you still have that. Also, if you considered Joseph Smith's false prophecies alone, 
He made many prophecies that never came to pass. He spoke to His um, followers while He was alive and He prophesied that Jesus would return within 56 years. And that would be in the History of the Church, Volume 2, page 189. He said, for the coming of the Lord, which is nigh, even 56 years should wind up the scene. That's been well over 100, 160, 170 years ago. Jesus did not return within 56 years of 1890, of when 1891 arrived. In the Doctrines and Covenants, there was the prophecy that the temple would be built in Missouri within Smith's generation. And I'm not going to quote all of this. I don't want to take up the time. But the Mormons were driven out of Jackson County in 1833. I'm quoting from another author. said they were not gathered there in accordance to this prophecy dealing with the building of the temple. Also, Joseph Smith gave a prophecy that all nations would be involved in the American Civil War. That's in a Doctrine and Covenant 87, verses 1 and 3. And I've got his words here before me. He talks about the southern northern states going to war. And this, this is clearly another false prophecy since all nations did not get involved in the American Civil War. And uh, there's also was a prophecy that the earth will tremble and the sun be hidden in not many days, he said. That's Doctrine and Covenants 88. Verse 87, and of course the sun hasn't yet been hidden nor the moon hidden its faces. Uh, also, he gave a prophecy that Isaiah 11 was about to be fulfilled. He quoted the 11th chapter in Isaiah saying that it was about to be fulfilled. And of course that's where that the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the kid. Uh, the wolf is not dwelling today with the lamb, by the way. And the calf and the lion are not together. The cow and the bear are not grazing together. The lion is not eating straw like the ox at this present time. And nursing children are not playing in the dens of cobras. That's in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11. So these prophecies alone of Joseph Smith prove him, and there's others, prove him to be a false prophet. Now, notice as we come to Romans chapter 16 and in verse 17, if you're taking notes, you can might want to write down Second Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 5. And in that passage, the Bible speaks of someone having a form of godliness, that is God-likeness, but denying the power thereof, he said, from such, turn away. There are those who have a form. They appear to be God-like. And I'm saying that this is true with Mormons. Now, in Romans uh, chapter uh, 16, and I'm just going to take one verse here from this passage. And you would notice with me here that he says in verse 17, you say, you may ask the question, why preach against Mormonism? Verse 17 Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, mark them, notice that, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and what's the next three words? And void them. So first of all, we are to mark them, we are to identify them if they're teaching doctrines contrary to New Testament Christianity, and secondly, we are to avoid them. When people deny the Scripture, deny the Trinity, deny the divinity of Jesus Christ, we are, number one, to mark them, and number two, we are to avoid them. That is, stay away from them. All right, now notice in 3 John, as we come here, 3 John, and I'm going to read just a few verses from this chapter. Now, a little bit of history, and uh, Joseph Smith was a polygamist. He's believed to be a Mason. Also was believed to be involved in the occult. 
made false prophecies, and definitely a racist. Joseph Smith wanted to know which of all the Christian churches were right and which should he join. The angel said none of them are right. All their creeds were an abomination in the in his sight, and all teachers were corrupt. Mormon church began because of the revelation of an angel, they say. Moroni. Moroni or Moroni is probably the best way to pronounce it. And what we're going to see tonight, there's the denial of the Trinity, denial of the Scripture, denial of the deity of Christ, denial of the blood atonement. On, on the night of September the 22nd, 18 and 23, Joseph Smith, Jr., a resident of New York, received a visit from an angel of light named Moroni, the glorified son of Mormon. The angel told him where to dig up the golden plates by which the Mormon Bible was translated from by means of the Urim and Thummim, a type of miraculous spectacles by which he could understand what was written on the plates. And of course, these were found in a state New York. These golden plates contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 14 according to their theology. Let me read this verse and then we'll go on. He says here in uh, 3 John, you'll notice with me, and I'm going to be reading from verse 7. 3 John verse 7. He says here, "For For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Anyone that denies, by the way, the Trinity, the Godhead, the divinity or deity of Christ, they are a deceiver and antichrist. He said, look to yourselves, in verse 8, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Verse 9, whosoever therefore, I'm sorry, let me start over, whosoever transgresses, that is to go beyond the limit, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Well, those are some strong words. But he said, don't even uh, receive the false teachings into your home, and neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So these are very strong words in reference to any false teacher, and especially Joseph Smith. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts in chapter 17. In the book of Acts in chapter 17. On April the 6th, 18 and 30, at Fayetteville, North, or, I'm sorry, New York, uh, not Fayetteville, but Fayette, New York, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints was officially founded with a membership of 30 souls. They moved to Kirkland, Ohio, and in six months increased over 16,000 souls. From Ohio, Smith made his thrust into Jackson County, Missouri, where they purchased 63 acres of land, which Smith said would be the spot for the Temple of Zion, the headquarters of the kingdom of Christ. Also in Illinois, the Mormons grew and prospered and practiced polygamy. The state of Illinois intervened and put Smith and his brother in jail in Carthage, Illinois, to await trial, but they were murdered by a mob of over 200 persons on 27th June, 1844. Brigham Young took his place and in 1846 announced that the saints would abandon 
um, Nauvoo, uh, and in 1847 they went as far as Great Salt Lake, Utah, he declared, this is the place. They have a turbulent history, and, um, and of course they grew by leaps and bounds and are growing today by leaps and bounds. In Acts chapter 17, we're coming now to, to our second uh, part, and that is the Scripture. And I emphasize this very, very much this morning, the importance of Holy Scripture. Now, the Mormons have four books they recognize as inspired. The Bible. Now, here's what they say about the Bible in Article of Faith, Article 8. They say, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God in so far as it is translated. In other words, they're saying there's mistakes in the Bible. They have the Book of Mormons, a collection of 15 books revealed to Joseph Smith on a golden plates, September the 22nd, 1827. And there's supposed to be 3,000 changes made to it between 1830 and 1837 edition. The third book that they have that they believe is inspired is the Doctrine and Covenants, which contain 136 sections and was published in its present form in 1876. And number four, the fourth book, is the Pearl of Great Price, which is the visions revealed to Joseph Smith and his interpretations of the Bible. Now, we're given a lot of warning in the Scriptures about Messing with God's Word. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, he says, don't add to the Word of God. Don't be taken away. He said, I'll add the plagues that are in the book. And he talks about taking a person's part out of the book of life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, he says there's no private interpretation. No one man has a handle on the interpretation of Scripture. And also in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, there are those that uh, Peter said that wrestle Scriptures to their own destruction. Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormons was more correct than the Bible. I'm quoting now from History of the Church, volume 4, page 461. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormons was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. The Book of Mormons was supposed to be complete in 421 A.D., and the King James was translated in 1611 but it quotes from the King James when quoting the Bible complete with the Old English. There's, there's, there's at least uh, 25,000 words from the King James that's in this, and the King James is supposed to have been translated some hundred years later. You'll notice with me as we come here to Acts chapter 17, I'm reading verse 10 and verse 11 for, for a particular uh, reason. And... Uh, Verse 10 and verse 11, we have these words. He said, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Verse 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And he says, In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scripture daily whether those things were so. The people of God searched the Scriptures. Even with the apostles preaching, they searched the Scripture. They had the Old Testament Scripture this time. But they searched the Scripture daily to see whether those things were so when people came along preaching. Scriptures, as I said this morning, was the foundation of their faith and their beliefs. The Book of Mormons is supposed to cover the account of the Hebrews leaving the Holy Land to come to America. I mean, you, I've read in this book, I, I did not do it this time in my study, but years ago, 
I did this. I think it's supposed to cover a period of time from probably even the Tower of Babel and Abraham all the way up to, you know, about 421 A.D. Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormons was the most perfect of any book on earth, and the golden plates from which it was supposedly translated have been conveniently taken back to heaven. Isn't that nice? No one else got to see them except Joseph Smith. Turn with me please to John chapter 4. Now I'm just briefly going through this and the reason I am, there is so much good material. There's books. There's pamphlets. There's a lot of good material written on Mormonism. So I'm just kind of giving you a few thoughts. I gave you a handout this morning. We've had some stuff in the past in the library. I don't know whether it's there now. But um, it's, it's easy to get good material on the subject of Mormonism. Now let's come to now the, the doctrine of God. And I'm going to be reading here in the book of John, the doctrine of God. And then we're going to consider for a few moments the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be through. I could carry you, we could talk about the priesthood, we could talk more about their history, we could talk about false prophecies, we could talk about a number of things, but I believe that these three thoughts, the issue of the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of God, and the doctrine of Christ, to me sums it up, I don't really have to have anything else to know that they're an occult and they're not a Christian church. Now, what about the doctrine of God? We know that there's only one eternal God, amen, as we talked about this morning. They have the wrong God, and if you're wrong on the doctrine of God, nothing else matters. Now, you think about that. If we're wrong on that and wrong on Jesus Christ, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what you believe. You're going to end up in a devil's hell. Now, here's some things that they believe. Let me read off about four or five things that they believe about God. And I'm going to read here in this passage. They believe that God the Father has a body of flesh and bone. Now, we know the Bible says God is a spirit. I'm going to be reading here in this passage. And, uh, you know, there's many other verses that will back up what we believe and teach that's in the Word of God. We don't have to go outside the Word of God. But they believe that the Father has a body of flesh and bone. They also believe that God evolved from mortal man and is changing, still in the process of changing. The Bible clearly says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that He should lie, nor the Son of man that He should repent. Psalms 90, verse 2 says, I do not change. They believe in many gods. Polytheism. They believe in many gods. And we know in Isaiah 44, 6, Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6, and many other places, that there's one true and living God. We know that. Every Mormon, by the way, can become a god. Every Mormon can become a god. And the Bible again, Isaiah 43, 10, 11, said there's no god before me and none after me. And that's the lie that came into the Garden of Eden. When Satan came and told uh, Eve, said, you shall be wise, you shall be as gods. You remember the story there? They hold firm to the belief that our God is a resurrected, glorified man. They say that God Himself was once as we are, and He is an exalted man. Here's the way they put it. As man is, God was, and as God is, man may be. I'm going to give you a quotation here from him in just a moment. In John chapter 4, verse 23 and verse 24, the Lord Jesus said, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
quotation from the Mormon church. It says, In the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and people it. When our father, Adam, came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael the archangel, the ancient of days. He is our God and Father and the only God with whom we have to do. Some good sounding words in there and some very confusing words in there. One of the passages that they use is in John chapter 10. I will read it to you before we move to the next point. In John 10. And they, they like to quote verse 34. And verse 34, And Jesus said unto them, Is it not written in your law? And that's in Psalms 82, the entire chapter. And uh, in this particular case, Psalms 82 verse 6 that he's quoting directly from. And he says, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? That verse is used by the Pentecostals. That verse is used by Mormons. And if you read the context, Jesus was speaking to a group of skeptical Jewish leaders that rejected Him. And they were well acquainted with the Old Testament in Psalms 82 and verse 6, which is not a future proclamation of Godhood. Psalms 82 is not dealing with a future state of everyone becoming a God, but rather He's dealing with leaders in Israel that He's going to judge. They're judges and He's going to judge the judges. He's not dealing there with the state of Godhood or a future state of Godhood. But many of them use this verse. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, you know, you, you could spend a lot of time studying their history, studying their doctrine, and all those kind of things. You could uh, probably even waste a lot of time studying this. But again, if I want to check somebody out, what do they believe about the Scriptures? What do they believe about the Godhead? What do they believe about Jesus Christ? And you usually don't have to go any farther than that. You ask the question, what think ye of Christ? As in Matthew chapter 22. Now let's come to our last point this evening, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Mormon Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. And I want to read here in this passage. Here's, I'm going to give you about six things that they believe about Jesus Christ. They believe that um, He is a man evolved to become a God. They believe that uh, He's one God among many gods. They believe that He is the brother of Satan, spirit brother of Satan. They believe that Jesus Christ was a polygamist or at least used to. They teach that Jesus Christ had at least three wives, the Marys and Martha, so He could see His seed before His death. They believe that He was born of Adam, God. And here's what they say. They say that the Mormon Jesus... Well, this is what I'm saying this evening about that, and I'm going to give you a quote. The Mormon Jesus was begotten by a sexual relationship with Mary and God the Father who had a body. Notice God had a body and He came and there's a sexual relationship and Jesus came from that. Brigham Young said, Jesus was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, but by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in heaven, the Adam God Doctrine is taught here even though they try to deny it. Some deny this teaching today, but Brigham Young was one of their prophets, and this is what he said. Jesus was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, but by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in heaven. 
We note according to John 1, verse 1 and verse 14, that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is God manifest in the flesh and He is to be worshipped. We find this true in many Scriptures such as John 9, 38, and Hebrews 1 and verse 6. He is to be worshipped. He is God manifest in the flesh. Now notice as we read in this passage, I'm going to be reading here, and by the way, they deny, I believe, the virgin birth also. He says here in chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writing, but a fear lest by any means as the servant beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, verse 4, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. There is another Jesus, the Jesus of the cults. There is another gospel, there is another spirit. In verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose ends shall be according to their works. They also say that the blood of Jesus Christ is ineffective to cleanse from all sin. You and I know tonight in 1 John 1, verses 7 and verse 9, that all sins and all unrighteousness can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when He hang on Calvary's cross, His last words were what? It is finished. He's talking about redemption for mankind. He's talking about the atonement. Now turn with me please to Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, and notice here. So what about... Christ, what about salvation in the Mormon church? Well, they believe that salvation is by faith, by baptism in the Mormon church, by obedience to the law and ordinances, the Mormon church, by their good works, by membership in the Mormon church. And again, that excludes everyone else outside of that. They believe that there is no salvation outside the Mormon church and they believe it is a process, this salvation is a process of self-perfection. You and I know that salvation is not by our works, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Uh, Galatians 2, 16 and many other places in the Word of God. Now notice in Galatians chapter 1, reading in verse 6 and 7, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying that this other gospel is not really another gospel. It's counterfeit. And he said, he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. And then he said, he said they're perverting the gospel of Christ in verse 7. Then in verse 8 he said, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have, re- we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be cursed. Well, if there was an angel, it was a fallen angel that appeared to Joseph Smith, and it was another gospel that was given to him. One last passage. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I thought earlier I would not even bring this subject up, but I'll at least mention it. See, there's so many doctrines in the Mormon church. The baptism for the dead, the priesthood, and all the many things that that go on inside of this organization. We're talking about here proxy baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. They take a very controversial verse, an obscure verse or a difficult verse, and the only verse they have and say, 
that there's a such thing as somebody living being baptized for somebody that had died. This is a second chance doctrine. This is salvation for the dead. This is the living. The living may be baptized for the dead, for those who have died without knowledge, listen, of the restored gospel of the Latter-day Saints. But here's the problem. I'll read it in just a moment. Here's the problem. This is the only reference they have. And it's taken out of context because the entire chapter is dealing with resurrection. Christ's resurrection, our resurrection. And the idea here of Christian baptism concerning death and the promise of the resurrection, and that's what this whole chapter is about, is it's about uh, the resurrection Christ was died and was raised again the third day, and that is proof that you and I will be raised again. That is proof that all of our loved ones that have died, that they'll be raised again. And if this is not the case, then our baptism basically is meaningless if the resurrection is not a reality. Notice, why did we believe? Why did we follow the Lord in believers' baptism? It's because we believe that there is a resurrection, right? And those who have gone before us are waiting for that resurrection. But here's what they do. Verse 29, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Or why are they then baptized for the dead? Take that one verse out of the context of where it's at, which is a resurrection chapter, and try to prove that somebody living can be baptized for somebody that died that did not have knowledge of the restored gospel that they preach. Because they believe that they're the only true church. And when the RLDS broke off from them, they believe they're the only true church. And there's other factions that's broken off that believe that they're the only true church. And so I'm going to stop right here. Again, uh, there's lots of material, lots of books, lots of pamphlets and charts and, and things of that nature that if you wanted to pursue this, you could study it for the next two years. If you wanted to dive into it that deep, there are rituals, there are ceremonies that some of them resemble the Masonic Lodge. And I mean, you, it's just, you could just spend a lot of time on it. It's not that interesting to me. And I wanted to give you three thoughts tonight to prove to you they're, they are a cult. They're not Christian. That is, their denial of Holy Scripture, their denial of the Trinity and the Godhead, and their denial of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need to go any farther. I don't need to waste my time trying to figure out all the details of the Mormon church. So we're going to stop right here.